This is episode 86 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and my guest tonight is making his debut on the podcast. He's an Oilers fan from Illinois who recently made his first trip to Edmonton, Brandon Krause. Brandon, how's it going tonight? I'm good, Eric. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, man. It's good to talk to you again. Uh, So I'm guessing you've been back home for a little over a week now. Are you missing Edmonton yet? Oh my God. Yeah. So we've been back like, uh, 10 days. <laughs> I don't think me and my wife have like stopped talking about it. You know, like she, <laughs> I think I'm more surprised at like the effect that it's had on her. Of course, like for me, this was like a pilgrimage that I've been planning for a long time and, you know, saving for and all that, you know, for her, you know, she's a hockey fan for sure, but it was more, you know, she wants to go and support me and you know what I love, but she totally fell in love with it just like I did. You know, she she actually texted me when I was at work yesterday. She's like, I think I've cried every day thinking about Edmonton (laughs) and just like, we just both cannot wait to go back. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was really, really hard for us to leave. Like more than any trip that I've really ever been on. Of course, you know, I, I knew that I would go and I would, you know, love to see them play at home, but it was so above and beyond anything I could have ever hoped for, um, for, for really both of us. It was our first like international trip together. Um, and really our first solo vacation, you know, just, just her and I, and, a really, really since we've been married, you know, um, so we've been married going on seven years now. So it was a big deal for us and man, it just exceeded every expectation we had. Oh, that's great to hear, man. And, you know, uh, Edmonton isn't a a city like New York or L.A., so they might not get as much tourist uh, destinations for as many people. But I I don't know that there's as a hockey fan for me, there's few places on Earth I would rather go just because, you know, I'm such a devoted Oilers fan that I I try to make it out there three or four times every season to see Oilers games. But um, you know, I think it's something we actually talked about when we ran into each other uh, after the the game a couple Saturdays ago. That you know, when you're there, you just feel the atmosphere that Oilers fans have. It's not a huge fan base. Uh, there are obviously some big market teams in other sports leagues or even in the NHL that might have a larger group of fans, but the devotion that Oilers fans have, I think, is unmatched. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we kind of heard a lot of that, you know, going into uh, the trip and even telling people we were going there. You know, Edmonton gets a bad rap, <laughs> like a really bad rap. Yeah, you, know, I, I, you sometimes just, hear like it's not on a player's uh, – like they'll have a 10-team a no-trade list and the Oilers are on it or it, because it's the most the, – the, the furthest north city of any – uh, North American major sports team that sometimes uh, it doesn't get thought of in, in the best light. But I don't know. For for me, I, I can't imagine a better place that I would want to play if I was in the NHL because to be a member of the Edmonton Oilers, especially when they're winning, there are a few places like it that you're probably going to ha- have that much fun. 100%. I mean, the the city is just like absolutely behind the team like I I would just much rather like as a player play in a city that's totally devoted to that team rather than being in you know a a New York or an LA where it's they're absolutely second fiddle to another team like there's so many other things going on in those cities oh yeah where would the LA Kings rank in terms of sports teams in that city oh I mean yeah I mean it's it's you have the Lakers, you have the Dodgers, you have the Rams. I mean, USC U- football USC probably football is is higher on the priority list than than LA Kings hockey. Even though, like, are there like yes, they get good attendance this and that, but it's it's way down on the pecking order. And, like just I mean, to relate, to, like you know, being in Illinois, like even Chicago, like Chicago is a football town. Like the Bears are a number one, no matter what. Like. Whether it doesn't matter, bad. you know. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, good or bad. You know, yeah, the Blackhawks are like an original six, but that is a Bears 
town and then it's a Cubs town, you know, like that is the pecking order. And then the Blackhawks, like, yes, they have a huge fan base, of course, but it's, they're clearly like third in that pecking order. And that's, that's really the thing that I love so much about, about Edmonton is it's the Oilers are front page news every, every day. Like it's them and everything else in the city. And you just, you just feel that just walking around that place. And I just absolutely love that devotion. Um, so like in baseball, like my whole fan, like I grew up a St. Louis Cardinals fan. My whole family is, is okay. Cardinals fans, save for my wife, who is a Cub fan, but <laughs> grew up a, a St. Louis Cardinal fan. Um, we go to a ton of Cardinals games every year. And when me and my wife were in Edmonton, it feels much like St. Louis in just that it's kind of a big little city, right? Um, like, yes, it's a city and it has a lot of amenities that a city has, but you can still maneuver around it. But like uh, St. Louis is a baseball town. Like they have a very rich, you know, tradition of Cardinal baseball. Um, it's a very winning franchise. Like they, right. they have a history of, of, of being a winning organization. You know, it's been around for forever, but it's Cardinals baseball and then everything else. And it's kind of oriented kind of like how uh, Rogers is where you have the arena and then you have the ice district, you know, in St. Louis, you have Bush stadium and then you have ballpark village and everything kind of, you know, the, the stadium kind of, has this draw to it and then they've kind of built out around the stadium which is kind of what they've done with with rogers now with like the bars and the restaurants and all that sort of stuff so i think there's subconsciously when i picked the oilers i think there was like this little you know maybe kinship in my mind where it's a smaller market but like a smaller market but like the oilers are the top revenue generating team in the nhl last year like the passion is off the charts for how small of a market it is. And that's kind of how the Cardinals, you know, are. For yeah, I think that's based. a good connection that you made there too. And, you know, I, I live one province over and our entire province has a million people uh, or just over, a little bit over a million. And then you look at the city of Edmonton, which also has a million people. So it's there, there's not a huge populace in this area, but I'll tell you, just going around my city where I live, um, it's Edmonton and Calgary are probably the two most popular teams, especially with people under 40. Uh, some older hockey fans cheer for an original six team uh, that was probably either passed down to them from their dad or their grandpa. But with Calgary and Edmonton being so close to here, Edmonton being the closest NHL city, I'm only five hours away. Uh, that sort of draws a lot of people to cheer for the team. And especially with Connor McDavid now, like uh, for the younger generation, even than myself, that would be a, a big reason for them to start following the Oilers. And, you know, just hearing you describe, like, what the Oilers mean to that city, it made me think back to uh, the first ever 30 for 30 doc that ESPN made back in 2009. And, you know, they've produced some great ones over the years, but my favorite is King's Ransom, which was mm -hmm. actually the first one they ever did, and it, it details the, the Wayne Gretzky trade from the Edmonton Oilers to the LA Kings back in the summer of 1988. And um, during the documentary, the, the director, Peter Berg, asks Wayne, what, does the, what do the Oilers mean to the city of Edmonton? And Wayne said, whenever I get asked this question by people in the United States, the way that I always try to describe it is like this. You know when the Olympics are on, and for those two weeks, it's all that anybody can talk about? That's what the Oilers are in Edmonton 12 months a year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and you really feel that. Like, as soon as you walk off the plane, I mean, the, the baggage claim is... Literally, the baggage claim is Oilers-themed. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's total devotion to, to that, that team. Like, it's the one thing that people, like, unite around, like, really rally around. You know, and, and it's it's got the same sort of uh, trappings of fandom, you know, especially, you know, today's trade deadline day. You know, you get the good with the bad. You know, there's very extreme, you know, emotions with that with that fandom. You know, people are very intense in their oh, opinions. Oh, yeah. When you're passionate, you're, you're either going to be passionate in a positive sense or a negative sense one way or the other. Yeah, 100%. Um, but it's, it's, it's just really cool to be 
a part of the fan base that just cares so much about it. Like it's, it's just always top of mind um, in that city, you know, everywhere you go, you know, people are talking about it and we didn't, we went just for like a regular homestand. Like everybody that was there would just say, you guys have to come for the playoffs. You have to come for the playoffs. The city like shuts down for the playoffs. And it was just so intense just for regular season games. Like we would go out and I'd be in an Oilers, you know, Jersey or whatever. We'd go into a store and just like the common person could spark up like a, a like a, a well thought out conversation about the Oilers. Oh yeah, and that's like, really not something you can just that talk I, hockey with anyone. Yeah, and that's not something that I've experienced. Like the closest thing I can relate it to is is going out in St. Louis with a Cardinals jersey on. Like you can do that, but it's not everybody's interested in baseball. It just seemed like everybody is interested in the Oilers in Edmonton, or at least has an opinion one way or the other, even if they're not necessarily, it's not necessarily their squad. Right. They will still, it sparks a conversation no matter where you go. And I mean, there is a professional football team in town in the the Canadian football league. And there are a a passionate fan base there for, for that team as well, but it's still nothing compared to the Oilers. Like they are the big show in town. You described a person perfectly. They are the front page news every day. Uh, I mean, even in the middle of summer, it could be uh, July 20th and fans are calling into the local radio shows talking about what the Oilers should be doing uh, this off season or, oh, they need to shoot more on the power player. Just anything to keep the conversation going. It, it doesn't really stop at all. Even in August, which are con- can sort of considered the dog days of summer, last year they hired their new CEO, Jeff Jackson. So then there was a yeah. ton of questions about what's going to happen leading into training camp. So it, it really never stops. Yeah, it was kind of funny. You know, we uh, I, I listened to, to 6.30 Chad, like Oilers now every day with, with Stauffer. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll mention every now and again, like, it's called Oilers now. And if they deviate at all from Oilers talk, <laughs> like their text line it, starts it to light true. up. Like, it's, they can't talk about anything else. Like you said, in the dog days of summer, when there's no, really st- nothing going on. <laughs> they still have to keep the conversation Oilers focused talk. on the Oilers. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Bob's a big supporter of the the U of A Golden Bears, too. And uh, I know he tries to sneak in a little bit of Bears talk every now and then. But like you said, the, the fans will uh, get him back on track right away. Like, hey, we want to hear about the Oilers. Tell us about the prospects down on the farm and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, it's an Oilers town for sure. And like I said, it was great to meet up with uh, you uh, after the Battle of Alberta a couple weekends ago. It's a... Uh, it's just a shame that the Oilers didn't pull out the win for us that night, but you know, it, it also worked out that I happened to be in town that weekend for our annual heavy hockey showdown charity game. And I think you were trying to come out to that as well, but we just didn't up uh, meeting up that day. Yeah, we, we kind of wandered around and, and stumbled upon it, you know, in the, that is such a massive like arena. Like there, there's so many things like interconnected with that area. It, it's easy to kind of get lost in. Uh, so we were able to, able to kind of, you know, scope it out from afar, but yeah. And on, going back to your point about, uh, you know, Bob with the U of A, that was one of the things I was really hoping to see, um, while we were there was a, a golden bears game, you know, cause you hear him talk about like Claire Drake and all that sort of yeah. stuff. I was like, man, yeah. it would be so cool to see like a game in that arena, you know, just a very historic, like college team like that. Fortunately it didn't work out, but that's definitely on my my to-do list, you know, one of the times we make it back up there. For sure. And, you know, I've never been uh, in that old building myself, but uh, the U of A definitely is one of the premier uh, university teams in Canada. They uh, recruit some of the best players in the country. So uh, they're perennially perennially one of the top teams uh, in the U sports. So uh, I, I would imagine that it's something similar to, playing at like Boston University in the States. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I, we started talking about doing this podcast together back in January, and I really wanted to wait until after your trip. So 
we could just kind of talk about your overall experience in oil country. And you've already sort of laid out uh, a little bit about how great of a time you had. But before we do that, since you are a first time guest on the show, I just want to start by asking about your own background as a fan. And, you know, you talked a little bit about the connection to uh, how it's similar to being a St. Louis Cardinals fan, but let's just go right back to the start. So I want to know, when did you first get interested in hockey and how did you become an Oilers fan living in Illinois? Okay. So I, hockey, so I'm, I'm 35. When I was growing up, hockey was not on any of like my family's radar, any of my buddies' radar. We couldn't have been further from our, our mind, you know, even so like if you draw a line between like St. Louis and Chicago, we're like right in the middle. So even being that close to two NHL teams, we just, it just wasn't something that really interested us. There was no kids playing hockey in the central Illinois, you know, it just wasn't a thing back then. And didn't the Blackhawks remember- lose the TV deal in the early two thousands too. So they had like no local television station covering the team. Uh, probably. I mean, that I think I heard sound, that, that, right? Yeah. That they, you know, there was still the national coverage games, but something about, uh, they didn't have any local games being shown regionally. And this is obviously before the Blackhawks had their, rejuvenation in the late 2000s and drafted Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves and became a Stanley Cup contender. But there were some bleak years there in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I remember every now and again, like, of course, I was aware of the sport and aware of the Blackhawks and the Blues, but it just it was never a thing like no one in my family was sitting down to to watch a hockey game. You know, no, none of my friends were running around in Blackhawks jerseys, you know, when we were kids, it just didn't happen. But when I was in high school, you know, so this would have been like mid 2000s, I just started to to get into it a little bit. I knew absolutely nothing about the sport and don't know any of the rules. Like at this point, I, I, I know nothing. I have no pull to any sort of team. I graduated high school in 2006, which is when the Oilers made their, their uh, cup run. And I remember watching those playoffs and it was really like the, the crowd, like in Rexall, just hearing that crowd, it was so loud and so intense and so like coordinated. It was totally foreign to me. Um, like that sort of passion. And that's really what kind of drew me to it. And I just started, I remember watching that, that cup run. I really liked the team. Um, I loved like Al Shemsky and Ryan Smith. And I didn't really know what I was watching at that point, but I, I knew I, you know, I was getting into the sport. I, I liked, uh, I liked to watch it. So I just kind of declared, okay, this is, this is my team. I, I really wanted to support a Canadian team. I didn't want to just grab the blues or the Blackhawks. Like I said, I had no like familial ties to either. I was like, okay, I want to do my own thing. I'm just going to, I want to support a Canadian team. It's, it's Canada's game. So why not? So I just picked the Oilers, you know, and I've just been riding with them ever since. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was like the start of a very dark period. <laughs> yeah, of time the, the, the next 10 years but, were pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in that, in that frame of time, so the Cardinals lost the world series in 2004 uh, the Bears lost the Super Bowl in 2005. Um, the University of Illinois is like 45 minutes from us, so we we go to a lot of their football games and their basketball games. So they lost the the college basketball championship in 05, and the Oilers lost the Stanley Cup, <laughs> like Stanley Cup Finals in 06. So mid 2000s was kind of a rough time for. for I always you, said but- I was kind of I was kind of born into the the misery, you know, but it's it's okay. You know, I mean, at least you were seeing your teams consistently make it to championship games. It's something that I, I think a lot of people would still take uh, that deal. Unfortunately, like you said, you'd, you'd like to uh, end on the, the right note on one of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had some redemption with the Cardinals, like they won yeah. the series in 06 and 11. But like the Bears have been pr- pretty much pretty awful my whole life, you know, <laughs> but but it's just... You know, it's just one of those things where you, you just you ride with them and, and hope one day they, they put it all together. Yeah, I guess their one Super Bowl would have been a little before you were born. Um, yeah, I mean, and God, <laughs> I, I was born a decade too late because really the 80s, <laughs> you know, that was the, the time Bears, the Bears and the Oilers were like dominating. 
Well, you know, I'm only a year younger than you, and uh, you know, it's pretty much the same. Like I've joked many times, like I, I love '80s music and movies, and obviously <laughs> the, a huge fan of the Oilers from that time period as well. So I wish that I could have been born like 15 years earlier and been a part of that uh, as well. I was alive for one Stanley Cup in 1990. Um, I would have been about a year and a half old when they won that one. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, I was born five months after the Gretzky trade, so I wasn't around for any of his time with the Oilers. But my fandom started pretty early on, too. My dad actually got me a Gretzky Kings jersey for my first birthday in uh, 1990, so that kind of started my Gretzky fandom, and I guess it's been like a 35-year sort of journey ever since. Um, But it's cool to sort of hear how you pick the team, because that 2006 run is still the most fun I've ever had watching hockey. Uh, And I had been following the team for probably about seven years by that point of being like a a true hardcore Oilers fan. Um, So when you're, you know, 17 and you're seeing your team go on this miracle run to the final after being pretty average uh, through the late 90s and early 2000s, the Oilers were always good enough to scrape and claw their way into the playoffs and they'd end up overmatched against a a true Stanley Cup contender like the Dallas Stars, who they seem to play every year. And uh, even though the Oilers would give them a a good series, they could just never get over the hump against them, except for the the one time in 97. But other than that, uh, it it was a a long period of time uh, between winning a playoff series even. And then they go on this incredible run, like we said, in 06. And that really gave the, the fan base a shot in the arm because for my generation, no one had ever seen the team go on a run like this. Cause like I said, I was only a year old the last time they won a cup. Uh, unfortunately, as we talked about the next uh, 10 years or even a little after that, even after they got Connor McDavid in 2015, uh, was, was still a pretty difficult time. But, uh, I think if we knew what was waiting for us at the end of that 10 years, uh, with obviously getting McDavid and, and the team that would be constructed in the years after, uh, we'd probably be willing to go through it again. Oh, absolutely. It's actually fun. Like I have, uh, so I, I'm, I'm in my basement right now, which is where I watch every, every Oiler game like in the same spot on my couch. You know, this is, this is, the home, this is home base right now. Um, so I actually have game three of those six cup finals on like little background. Oh, really? Set the mood real quick. Yeah. Um, but totally. And you know, it's kind of funny, you know, Twitter has been on fire the last few days with, uh, the trade deadline and all that. Right. And, you know, people are always going to be, you can never do enough. Like Ken Holland couldn't, couldn't make enough moves to make everybody happy. Uh, but I always think back, I, I really try to always keep front of mind. Like, is it disappointing? We haven't made it to like a cup final with, with Connor and Leon. Yeah. In, in year nine. Yes, of course it is. But I remember how low it got. And I, I consider us incredibly fortunate to watch, you know, when it's all said and done, our, arguably the greatest hockey player ever, you know, certainly top three, top five. Yeah. Uh, so I always, you know, even, even in, even when we were two, nine and one, like y- you knew that it was going to turn around. Like they, they just were too good to be playing like that. Um, exactly. But I, but I always try to keep that in mind. Like this is a, this is a very charmed time to be an Oilers fan. And I don't, I don't forget what it used to be like, you know, and how, how low that it got. So, you know, it's, it's been a pretty remarkable run the last, you know, hopefully we have another, you know, decade plus of of Connor and Leon, but you'd hope (laughs) we've been pretty lucky this last decade. Well, I mean, think of it like this, Uh, especially the past five years, the Oilers have finished second place in their division every year. I'm including this year as well, because I do think that they will finish second again. Uh, That's five straight years of home ice advantage in the first round. So they're consistently a strong regular season team in anywhere from that. uh, I think their best was in 2016, 17. Now that that predates the the five years even, because there were two years in there where they missed the playoffs in 2018 and 2019. But Anywhere from sixth place to about twelfth place, they've they've been relatively in that area. So we're seeing a team that's near the top of the league and has made one conference final so far. So like they they've given us 
a, a plenty to cheer about in that time, but it's just, it's like you said, you would think that with arguably the two best players in the world and Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, they would have made it to a Stanley Cup final by now. And I really think that if they would have got by Vegas last year, they would have won it. And uh, let's keep in mind, it was a 2-2 series in Game 5, and the Oilers had a 3-2 lead in the second period. They led in every game in that series. If they close out that game uh, in Game 5 on the road, and instead of taking those two penalties that led to three goals in three minutes in Vegas, uh, th- three goals against, I should say, uh, maybe we're talking about uh, a team that's already won a Stanley Cup because I think they would have beat uh, Dallas in the conference final and I think they would have beat Florida in, in the cup final. So it's uh, it's frustrating that it came to a crashing end uh, in game six on home ice. It's the second straight year that the Oilers have been eliminated by the eventual Stanley Cup champion on their home ice. So it's not the way you want that to end, but let's hope that they can use that as some extra motivation and learning lessons to make sure that doesn't happen again this season. Yeah. And I, you know, even, you know, two years ago when they made it to the the conference finals, you know, they got swept by Colorado. Like, even though they didn't make it to the third round last year, I feel like last year there's there, there was a, they're a better team last year. Yeah. I think they were too. They just ran into a juggernaut, you know, and they just couldn't quite. They were right there. God, they were right there. I don't think I mean, Vegas get, was as it, good as Colorado was, though. The Oilers could have yeah. beaten Vegas. I, I don't think anyone was getting by Colorado in 2022. But if some things had went better, if the Oilers would have got a few more bounces, like Vegas had tremendous puck luck in that series. And if you go and look at all the advanced numbers, like they they did win a lot of those uh advanced analytics uh, against the Oilers in the series. But yeah. realistically, if Stuart Skinner comes through with a few more saves uh, and if a few of the Oilers' top attackers don't go cold in that series, maybe it goes a little differently. Uh, it's hard to blame anyone too much, though, because uh, any of the guys that we're talking about were so valuable in even getting them to that point that it's hard yeah. to pick them apart too much for having an off series. But I do think that they, they had a realistic chance of beating Vegas last spring. Um, whereas Colorado two years ago, I, I just, I don't think the Oilers could have done anything to get by them. They, they probably could have won yeah. one of those games, but uh, as far as beating them four in a series, I don't think that was going to happen. And maybe if Petrangelo got more than one game for that uh, slash <laughs> on dry sidle, you know, it might have been a little different. Or, I'm not, or I'm not bitter or anything. Yeah, well, don't <laughs> even up the calls either. I mean, and then you get Nurse who gets suspended a game for uh, instigating a fight in the last minute. But I don't know. It's it's something that's going to send us off on a completely another tangent. But um, instigating into a fight that the other guy was ready and willing to fight. I mean, it was yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a frustrating series, but... For sure. And when we were talking about um, the 06 run a few minutes ago, you mentioned Ryan Smith and Alish Hemsky, and those were my two favorite players during that era. Still two of my favorite Oilers players to this day. Uh, so I'm guessing that those were your, your favorite Oilers when you first started. Um, they were just the most popular players on the team for years. I mean, Ryan Smith was the poster boy for the Oilers. And after he was traded in 07, Hemsky was the main reason to watch the team for about five years there uh, during some, some pretty dark times for the Oilers. Uh, did you have any other oil favorite Oilers players uh, when you first uh, started following the team? Um, so I, I did love George LaRock, you know, I didn't get to watch him all that much because it was, it was the tail end of his, his, yeah, that career. was his last time with his last season with the yeah. Oilers. Yeah. But, uh, you know, once I started to get into him, I kind of get a, did a deep dive on, on their history and just seeing all of his, uh, his fights and, you know, I, yeah, I just the former heavyweight those. champ of the league. I love those players that, uh, you know, like, like the Ryan Smiths where they're not, they're not the best like skater. They're not the best puck handler, but it's like pure will and determination. You know, that it, it's kind of like what Zach Hyman is now. Like, you hear about him growing up, like he was never labeled as, you know, the, the, the second coming. The Florida Panthers uh, spent some time in college hockey and then the minors before 
making his way to the league. I think he was 24, I want to say, when he first broke in, 23 or 24. So, you know, he paid his dues uh, before getting his first shot in the yeah. league. That's like like one of my favorite players right now is 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 Vinny. And he, he, he has like, you know, a seventh round pick. You know, you really, <laughs> you barely have a shot to really make it in the league. And he's he's gotten so much better. He's so likable, first of all, but he's gotten oh, so yeah. much better, you know. And, and especially this year, um, he's just so showed so much growth. And he's just such a, a team guy. You know, he plays with an edge. But another one of those things, like he's just he's just a worker. You know, he's just always working on his game. He's not the best at, at any particular thing, but he's going to give you everything he has. Um, and that's I mean, it helps that he's six foot seven two, and and that he can, you know, has a long reach with that stick and can kill penalties. I mean, he he knows his role and he plays it effectively. That he's not trying to be anything uh, that he isn't out there. I'm so glad he scored his first NHL goal in the Heritage Classic back in October too. I mean, what a stage to finally score your first goalie. He didn't make it to the NHL until he was almost 27. Uh, the chances of a a first or of a seventh round pick even playing one game in the NHL are extremely slim. So he's beat the odds already just by even playing for the Oilers. But the fact that he's now become an everyday player for this team on the third pairing, and we've even seen him elevated into the top four a little bit as of late. I mean, that's just a, a huge success story for the Oilers, and they have another seventh round pick in the minors too, is from my home province that is trending in the right direction as well. So. Uh, that's huge for the organization to find some uh, capable players who could actually fit into your NHL roster that late in the draft. Yeah, for sure. He's been a he's been a real revelation, a real find for that. Team. And I, I like what you said about Ryan Smith too. I mean, you look at Alish Hemsky, tremendously skilled player. You know, one of the smoothest players I've ever watched. Uh, could just thread the needle with the puck so effortlessly. Uh, such a skilled playmaker and and stick handler. Smitty, he was the the crash and bang kind of guy. Go to the net, find that loose puck or rebound and put it home. Um, and, and like you you kind of described so well, he wasn't uh, the most skilled player you ever saw, but you know he played 19 seasons in the NHL and he scored nearly 400 goals. Like you don't hang around for that long unless you're a good hockey player. And he also made Team Canada twice at the Olympics, which I often call the hardest team in hockey to make. To be you know, to be one of the top twelve forwards on Team Canada is extremely difficult. Um and the fact that he was there in the two thousand six or sorry, two thousand two and two thousand six Olympics, uh, you know, that just kind of shows what a what a valuable player he was during that time. And I'm glad that he did win a gold medal in 02 in Salt Lake City as well. Yeah, and just he's just like a total leader too. Like he's just I don't know. I mean, he he's just he's just like one of the all time Oilers, you know? Yeah. And I I mean I think that most Oilers fans uh will never forget his farewell game in twenty fourteen when he retired. Uh, just seeing him skate out on the ice with his five-year-old son and wave goodbye to the crowd. It was such an emotional uh, farewell. Probably the only final game that I can think of that's similar to that was Wayne Gretzky's in 1999 at Madison Square Garden. They're they're very similar uh, in that sense. But uh, the fact that Ryan Smith got to have that one last curtain call at uh, at the old Rexall place was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, no one, de- no one more deserving than Smitty for sure. And uh, what do you remember about your first Oilers game? Uh, what arena was it in? What year was it? Who was it against? First live game. So, yeah, your first live game. So pretty much any time that they're in St. Louis, we go. Um, first one is probably not until like 2019, though. Okay. Uh, be- before we actually started started to go my first ever game was actually a blue jackets bruins game my my buddy went to uh ohio state was was getting his phd at the time and we were we went to visit him and went to a a a bruins and blue jackets game but uh but now anytime that they're in st louis we're there we've seen them in chicago too chicago's much more of a hassle to get through and get to the arena and you know, Chicago, 
it's just it's more trouble to get through the city to to go to a game. So the the time has to work out right. You know, if it's a if it's a work night, it's it's awful hard to make the trek up to United Center and then back all in one night. You know, it's much easier in St. Louis for us. Uh, yeah. But yeah, anytime a little less Louis, of a metropolitan right. city than Chicago. Yeah, it's much easier in and out in St. Louis. So, but yeah, anytime they play the Blues, we're there 100. percent Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess it would vary because some years they would play there twice, and other years just once. I, I think they have to play them yeah. one more time this year, right? Yeah. So we get two games in St. Louis this okay. year. Okay. Last year we only got one, and and it kind of timed weird this year because so the first time we got to see them was, um, it was two days before we actually left. For Edmonton, you know, yeah. it all was just bang, bang, bang. Um, that game didn't turn out so well, but it was my first time. So I took my parents to that game. They have never been to a hockey game before. They they know how much I love the Oilers and how much I love hockey. So that was like my uh, Christmas present to them. Was I took them to their their first ever, not only their first NHL game, their first hockey game. You know. Period. Full I remember stop. seeing the picture you posted with uh, them, and I think your wife was there too. Yeah, yeah. So I, I bought them all oiler gear. You know, got nice. them all, all decked out. Uh, you know, gave them the. You know, because they're used to going to Cardinals games in St. Louis. You know, but now we're all marching into enemy territory. A <laughs> <So. laughs> little different but, uh, cheering for the opposing team this time. Yeah, no doubt. St. Louis fans are, are pretty. They're pretty mellow, though. They're, you know, we don't get haggled too much or anything. But that was really cool. That, that was a really, really cool experience, you know, to to see them, you know, enjoying the game. You know, they, they don't really know the rules or what's going on or anything. Right. Uh, so I was, you know, I was kind of sitting in between my my dad and my mom and kind of explaining as as they were uh, going along what was happening. But but they they absolutely loved it. I mean, th- there's no better live sport than hockey. It It doesn't matter. Like you could have no idea what's going on and enjoy a hockey game. Um, but yeah, they absolutely fell in love with this. So they're actually going back with us again. Oh no way! That's awesome. Yeah, they they're totally they're totally in on it now. Uh, my my dad's even like wanting to go to, with us to Canada sometime and and have the old ex- whole experience we just had. Oh so, wow! Yeah, that's been it's been super cool. Um, I don't know that he's sitting at his house every night, you know, watching the Oilers like I am, <laughs> but. We'll get there. It's baby steps. No, that's very cool, though. And it's cool that you can sort of teach your dad about the sport. It's sort of the opposite for me, because like my dad grew up playing it from a very young age and was you know, a pretty good uh, player in his teens and into his uh, 20s playing senior men's hockey. And then, uh, you know, taught me all about the Oilers in the 80s. And of course, I went out and learned more on my own, too, and uh, became a huge fan of the team. But uh, it's sort of awesome that you can do the opposite and sort of be the one teaching your dad about the sport. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, we got there early and, you know, I was, I I always like to watch them warm up. Um, but I told him like, you guys are very fortunate because you get to see one of the greatest players that's ever lived in your first (laughs) NHL game. And even, you know, without even saying that, like they could both tell the way you can tell that he's better than everyone else. Yeah. He's just different. The way he, the way he moves in warmups is different, but the way he like transitions up the ice, the way he handles the puck, like his speed is on a, on another level. Um, so that was that was really really cool to experience that with them. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could take someone like you said to their first hockey game and know little to nothing about the sport, and uh, just watch number ninety seven play, and you'll be able to tell that he's on a different level than everyone else. Uh, so you you kind of explained how often you try to see the Oilers play, and um, obviously St. Louis seems to be the the spot you see them more often than Chicago. But uh, let's just go over since you said you've been cheering for them since '06, so that's 18 years now. What is your all time favorite memory since you became a fan of the team? Oh man, that's hard. Um, it's well, let's recent. narrow it down. Give me, give me two or three of your favorite then. It's recent and it might be generic, but Battle of Alberta when mm-hmm. Connor scored the the winner, game I five mean, in overtime at the, the Saddle Dome. Ju- the jubilation that I felt in that moment, like I think I woke the whole neighborhood. 
that was, was such like pure euphoria. <laughs> like yeah. it, it was one of the greatest moments of my sports life. Um, especially with like how that series started, like that first game was so Ugh. intense and so like, it was a nine, six. I mean, and, it was, and they had lost nine, five to the flames about a month earlier in the regular season too. So it was back to back. So to, good. Yeah. That year. Like, they, I mean, they, they finished I mean, seven points. A decade of, of intense, like battle of Alberta. Yeah. Um, you would have thought that it would have, but, their, their team obviously fell apart after that. Uh, crushing loss to the Oilers in the playoffs, but no, that was uh, that was the most intense battle of Alberta that I think I've I'd ever seen. Well, I know that I'd ever seen actually, um, because when I was a kid, the Oilers and Flames both weren't that good. Like the Oilers, like I said, were sort of a middle of the road team, but it was the Flames that were consistently missing the playoffs. They missed for seven straight years. So when I was like in elementary school. I didn't really even hate the Flames that much because they weren't a big rival. It was the Dallas Stars or the Vancouver Canucks that I despised more. Uh, obviously, the Flames then turned it around uh, in the mid two thousands, going on their own Cup run in '04, and that sort of uh, the rivalry picked up again after that. Um, but then, even into the the last ten years, uh, it, it didn't really get going again until 2020. There was that memorable regular season game that the Oilers won eight three at the Saddle Dome, where there was the goalie fight between Mike Smith and right. uh, uh, Camp Talbot right before the pandemic hit. And then, of mm-hmm. course, you come back from that, and uh, there's no fans in the building for parts of two seasons, so that really affects the the intensity in the games as well. But that 2022 playoff series is something that this generation of Oilers fans will never forget because they hadn't played in the playoffs in over three decades. And now here they are clashing in this uh, Pacific Division final series to see who goes on to the Western Conference final. And uh, like you said, it didn't get off to a good start. The Oilers were embarrassed on uh, in enemy territory uh, on that first game. And, but after that, they completed the gentleman's sweep, winning four straight, including that epic win in overtime in the Rivals Arena. So I, I don't think that, other than the 2006 Stanley Cup playoff run, you could think of anything that would have topped that in the last 15 years. Other than them winning the lottery to get McDavid, that's pretty, uh, yeah. that's pretty hard to beat. In terms of on-ice moments, though, that would that would definitely be the best one that the Oilers have had since going to the, the Cup Final in 06. Yeah, I mean, that one is just seared into my mind. There's been a lot of great series, you know, lately. Like, the Kings series. You beat the been... Kings a couple times, yeah. yeah but it's still nothing like are... knocking out your biggest rival in the playoffs in their building. For sure. I'm just That's waiting it. for us to... I just want to knock out Vegas so bad. Yeah. Like, that That will be... That's, that's, that's the next step. Like, I... I, huh, I cannot stand that team. They they drive me absolutely crazy. I, and for all the right, I mean they're they're a great they're a great team, but very unlikable team too. Very unlikable. They talk about like a charmed fan base. Like you you come in six years ago, you've been to four you know conference championships. You've won a cup. You know you've been two to Stanley Cup finals. They they went to the final in their first season as an expansion team. Like talk about spoiled, but I mean super aggressive manner. You know management group. Yeah. You know it's off to them. They certainly know how to game the system. To, <laughs> they know how to circumvent end. the cap. That's for sure. Oh yes, they uh, do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's God. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm praying for the day that we, that we knock them out. Yeah, that would be a very satisfying victory. And uh, I, I know you mentioned that you're a big Cardinals fan, and you have seen them win two World Series uh, in your lifetime, but. Uh, where would an Oilers Stanley Cup victory rank for you in terms of importance for sports? Number one, it's number one. Number there's one no, the there's no other, there's no other team that consumes as much of my time and energy as the Oilers. Like I, I love, I love all sports, you know, all sorts of sports. Like I love the Bears, I love the Cardinals. Uh, so you would like, pick an Oilers up, Stanley Cup I, over a Chicago Bears Super Bowl win? Yes. Yes. And that's, and I was, like, when I was, like, my bedroom as a child 
was all Chicago Bears wallpaper. So I was born into that. And, you know, in the fall, like, I watch every Bears game. It's not that I'm any, like, less of a fan. Right. But the Oilers mean so much to me. Like, I, I don't miss, like, a pregame, a postgame, let alone a game. And I listen to Stoffer every day and Jason Greger and Oilers Nation and, of course, your podcast. But it's... Appreciate that. <laughs> like, it just it, it just takes up, like, from sun up to sundown. It's yeah. it's about the Oilers. You know, like, I, I listen to... I'm a barber so i listen to it you know in my office you know tomorrow i'll have i'll be in the shop tomorrow but in my office you know they play a matinee game so i'll have it on in my office and i'll be you know jogging back and forth uh you know keeping tabs on the game and then when i get home tomorrow night i'll watch the whole game in its entirety uninterrupted so there's just no other team that that takes as much energy but i but i i just love them so much like i have such an affinity for this this team and this organization and, and this city and it's it's gotten so much more intense like since we've actually been there like i see yeah. feel such a such a deeper appreciation for them um it was almost like it was meant to be that i would that i would be you know it sounds a little corny but it was almost like meant to be that i would find this team and like they would be my my nhl team yeah, similar color scheme to the Bears, too. So pretty easy for you to just kind of keep the blue and uh, orange trend going. <laughs> yeah, a l- little different shade, but yeah. A little different totally. shade, yeah. I mean, orange and blue, like, <laughs> and you got, like, Illinois. Like, we're big Illinois, you know, fighting Illini fans. That's orange yeah. and blue, too. So, yeah, just just must be the must be the colors. <laughs> it, it worked out perfectly there. And, you know, I feel the same way about the team, man. And I, I mean, look, you met a ton of Oilers fans when you were here recently. Uh, I'm sure that everything that you're saying about the team right now is exactly how they feel too. I mean, we we've talked about this a lot tonight, but it just, it's a team that consumes us. It's for like, for me, it's an all consuming passion. I I mean, I write about the team for uh, the website here. I host a podcast about this team. Uh, It's, it's the team that I've followed and every single day for the past 25 years, Uh, hearing you, describe what your fandom is like very similar to mine and i know we're not alone in that either yeah i mean it's just i just since i started following them i just can't help it you know like i just it's just part of who i am now yeah like it's it's all over (laughs) yeah i mean it's on my car you know i have you know a big old oiler sticker a big oilers nation fist you know when the playoffs come i got the car flags on like I'm just the weirdo in the middle of Illinois with the full blown <laughs> Oilers obsession. Um, I've never encountered another one in my town before. No. <laughs> you know, it's all blues and Blackhawks. It it just elicits more eyebrow raises than anything. Like, what are you doing here? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just they're just a part of who I am. Well, that's awesome, man. And uh, I think I told you this already, but you're only the second American Oilers fan I've ever had on the podcast. Um, but it's just, it's awesome to see how many other Oilers fans there are from around the world. I have I think I've had six different countries that I've had uh, Oilers fans from. There are two guys from Brazil who I know who are hardcore fans of this team. They've been on the show a bunch of times. So when you see fans from Australia, Brazil, Sweden, England, Germany that are all following this team. You know, it's pretty cool because they're not the New York Yankees. They're not the LA Lakers. They're not these global brands that everybody recognizes. Uh, There might be a lot of people who don't even know who the Edmonton Oilers are if you're not a a fan of the sport. So to have this team that we're all so connected to from around the globe, I think it's awesome to see that this small market team has made that big of an impact. Yeah, totally. I mean, and there's like a common thread throughout all of our fandom, you know, with the the draw to this team and this city. But I mean, even when I picked him, I couldn't have picked Alberta out on a map. If you gave it no. to me, <laughs> I had no idea where it was. I couldn't have picked a farther away team for me, you know, 2000 miles away. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man, there, there was just something about it. And it was, it was obviously the right choice back then. Definitely was. All right, let's dive into your trip now. And uh, I know you flew to Edmonton a few days before your first Oilers game at Rogers Place, which gave you the chance to explore the city a bit. And you posted some great pictures from around Edmonton on Twitter. Uh, I just want to know, what were some of the best spots you checked out in those first few days in town? 
Oh, so yeah. So when we, so we got to town on a Sunday, the first game we went to wasn't until Wednesday. So when I booked the trip, I actually, we were set to fly in on Wednesday, which is when they played the Bruins. We were only going to be there seven days, but I had put a tweet out, um, in, in like early January, just asking, like, just saying like, Hey, me and my wife are coming to Edmonton for four games but you know are there any like bars and restaurants and just things you know that that we should do while we're there and it just like blew up like it totally lit up we got so many re- reply and i don't have like a lot of followers on on twitter by any means but it's a totally ton took of off. interaction the last few weeks though yeah oh my god yeah it's it's really blown up since uh since it was this was really the tweet that set it off but i mean it's just i was i thought i'd get get like a few replies um but i got so many dms and messages and and just suggestions of things to do and people happy that we were just coming all that way to their city uh that i was like okay you know let's extend this and really kind of soak up everything that that edmonton has to offer so the first thing we did so we stayed right downtown the first thing we did when we got to our hotel you know, I, I dropped my bags and I was like, I, I need to go see the ice district. So we, we walked out of our hotel for about two blocks away. And I remember walking up and we walked up to where like the, the rink is outside, like where the, the moss pit is and all that for the, the playoffs, where the team store is. And I remember like just being totally awestruck to see that in person. Like I just seen it so many times on TV I mean, Lord knows how many many things I've ordered from a uh, ice district authentics, <laughs> but and now here you are. Just to, yeah, but just to like walk there and like, like I was just like breathing the air around that arena. It sounds so corny, but it was like no, emotion. It's, it's true. I mean, it you're... was totally emotional for me. Like I was getting choked up just walking up to it. I couldn't believe I was there finally after all these years, all the planning, all the saving. You know, just everything that we put into this trip, like, I just couldn't believe, I was just like, this is going to be the greatest 10 days of my life. And it was absolutely the greatest 10 days of my life. But even in that moment, I had no idea how much better it would be than even I thought it would be. Um, so, yeah, we, we did that. We went to the team store, you know, went to the ice house and <laughs> the first thing we had, we had a couple Molsons and some poutine with donut air meat. You know, just had to get fully into uh, Canada. Embrace mode. the Canadian culture. <laughs> Absolutely. But then the next day, I kind of did like a sightseeing tour. So we went and saw um, Commonwealth. You know, just walked around outside. Right. Saw uh, saw Rexall. That was really really cool. That was on my list. You know, I. I never obviously got to go there, but just to be like that place just has like an air about it. You know, I know it's kind of like run down, <laughs> you know, it's, it's definitely a, an, an aging, you know, building. Don't know. Yeah, how it was much built almost 50 years standing. ago. <laughs> yeah. But like just so much history in that oh, place, absolutely. just to be around it. Like I'm just glad to be you around. got to see it because, you know, even though you never had a chance to watch the Oilers play live in that building, uh, it must have been so cool for you just to see this historic arena where the Oilers won four of their five Stanley Cups and set countless NHL records back in the 1980s. Yeah, I mean, just yeah, it just had it's just got an air about it, man. Like, and, and that was like my first foray into like watching the team. It was in that building in the pregame before that those '06 Finals homes games were like the loudest I've ever heard a building like through a TV in my life. Like I still watch those pregame videos. Um, <laughs> just to get like fired up. I mean, you said you like, got game three on right now. I do. It's just a reverberating like concrete box in there. Yeah. Like it's just, God, it was so cool to see that place. I was so happy that I got to, you know, I didn't know really how close I could get to it. We ended up driving through like an industrial park to get back to it. I was like, I'm right. pretty sure we shouldn't be here, but we're just dumb tourists, you know? So I drove up to it and yeah, just like, like I said, just kind of put my hands on it, you know, feel it. It's like, wow, this is, this is the house that Gretzky built and yeah. Messier built. And like just to be there was, was really unbelievable. So we did that. 
um, and, and yeah, I mean, just kind of took in the city, like just kind of drove around the city. It's, it's really cool how it's set up, you know, cause you, you have like the Valley right there and then the, like the downtown, like the city is kind of like up on a hill. Um, it's yeah. kind of oriented, uh, in a, in a cool sort of way. So just kind of walked around there, um, drove around. We went to uh, like some breweries and stuff like that on the first night, you know, and just kind of chatted with the locals and, um, yeah. And then the, the Tuesday we, we went to, we did an overnight in Banff. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about that more in a minute too, but you know, I, I like just looking through all your pictures and like, you know, you, you basically hit a lot of the good spots to go to just, of course, seeing, uh, the old Northlands Coliseum would be right at the top of it. I'm glad you got a chance to go see the the 12 foot Stanley Cup statue that uh, I was uh, DMing you about back in January. So that's got to be uh, on your list of places to go as well because uh, it's really cool to see that one that came. I think it was put up in 07, um, and just seeing the Wayne Gretzky statue outside of uh, Re- or Rogers Place too. It was outside of Rexall for 27 years. Uh, until they they moved to the new downtown building in 06 and uh i mean you got to get a picture with gretz right oh absolutely yeah that was really cool to see and it, when we were driving from the airport we we drove right past the stanley cup you know we circled back around and and stopped at it the next day but drove right past the the cup i was like oh crap that's where eric told me to go so yeah <laughs> yeah and that's the thing like just everywhere around town like that's what you see it's just so hockey centric you know you see oilers oh, yeah. flags and you can't go too far without seeing an Oilers logo in that town. Yeah. And just to drive, like even to see like all the companies that sponsor the Oilers, like see Boston pizza or pizza 73 yeah. or Scotiabank or, you know, all the, all these different places. That was really cool for me to see, you know, I've heard about them for so, so long, you know, to go into a store and see Will Hawk beef jerky from Bob Stoffer, the best <laughs> yeah. you ever tasted. You know, just to see stuff like that. See stuff that you you hear the advertisement for on his radio show every day, and then here it is now. And, you know, just I want to go back to what you said earlier about just taking in the atmosphere of being in the moss pit. And, um, you know, I, I don't think it's corny at all that, you know, you were getting a little choked up being there because at this point you've been following the team for almost two decades so to be a devoted fan for that long, and this is your first time getting to go there. I mean, I don't even live in the city, but I still get to go to Edmonton several times every year to go watch the team play. And and for you to wait 18 years and, and to finally be there, I can just imagine that that must have been uh, one of your ultimate sports memories. Oh, it definitely was. I mean, yeah, it, it was like a pilgrim pilgrimage for me you know yeah. and i i my wife knows how much i was i was looking forward to this i was literally counting down the days until i finally got to do this um and it it'll was be a just, tough trip to top it'll be a very tough trip to top but i can promise we're gonna try to every year from here on out um <laughs> that's awesome because that was actually going to be one of my next questions for you is that it is coming to edmonton going to be an annual thing for you now yeah, I will not spend another year of my life without going there at least one time. And that's I, awesome. My wife is a hundred percent on board with that. Like, I would really like to. I've got to make it for a playoff run. Like, that's yeah, just, I've oh. got to get there for the playoffs. Like, I'm really, I'm actually trying to make it happen this year. If I, you know, it's a quick turnaround for it us. It is to come right back. But I mean, look, I went to my first Oilers playoff game two years ago. And other than the two heritage classics that I've attended, it was the most expensive hockey ticket I've ever purchased. Um, and even though they lost to the Kings that night, I don't think I've ever heard the building louder. It was the best atmosphere for a game that I've ever experienced. So uh, if you thought a regular season game was incredible, this is several notches up from that. Yeah, and that's that's all we heard from people, you know, was just you guys have to come back. For a playoff run right so that that's really like a number one on my list but but we'll definitely do like a home stand a year you know once the schedule comes out try to time it around it yeah, yeah. and yeah, you know we'll that's like out. my my buddy who lives in australia 
Um, he came out in 2015 and it was his first time uh, in Canada as well. And first time going to see the Oilers play live. And um, just, I was there for that with him because I went to some of the games uh, with him at that time and just hearing his experiences uh, and, and his thoughts on it, it sounds so similar to what you're saying right now. And um, unfortunately he hasn't had a chance to come back in the past uh, nine years to see them play, but I, I keep hounding him that, Come see McDavid while he's in his prime. You you want to see him while he's at this level and while the team is a, a top contender in the NHL. I say that to my buddies in Brazil too. Like, uh, you know, you could see the Oilers any time in your life, but you want to see them while Connor is in his prime and and while this team is pushing for cups. So um, I really hope you get the chance to come back in April and and see in a playoff game this year. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's that's definitely the goal, and you know kind of circling back you know when we were you know got there and like really wanted to experience the city yeah i think a lot of people just kind of take it for granted like the oilers are just in their backyard the people that live there like the Oilers are just there obviously they're they're fans but they're just there they 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 get to a you know a, a game to them is just another night you know but yeah i think that's part of what resonated at least with our trip you know with with some of the people on, on Twitter, like with the engagement that I would get as I would post and, you know, just be like so enthusiastic about the city and, you know, kind of the things that, that Edmonton has to offer, or even like Alberta has to offer that some people might take for granted. I mean, it's just like living anywhere, you know? Oh, stuff. there's always places. I mean, uh, I mean, I love California. Uh, I've been seven times in my life. Um, and for people who live in, uh, Southern California and go to the beaches or uh, go to Disneyland or SeaWorld or any of these like uh, touristy destinations, they they might take it for granted. I mean, there's people who have annual passes to these uh, attractions, right? But when you live further away and you get to go there, it's such a bigger deal. And maybe from a sports comparison, I could say um, there's a lot of NFL fans in Canada as well. So if you're a, a big football fan, uh, and you live far away from any NFL city, getting the chance to go down to the States and see a game live might be similar to what you're describing about coming up here to see the Oilers. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's real. I wanted to highlight that too. Like I said, you know, when we, when we would tell people we were going, like their first reaction was, why are you going in February? And why are you going to Edmonton? You know, of all places you could go, why are you going there? And at the coldest so, time. <laughs> at the coldest time. But I mean, you know, any place is what you make it. I mean, any place has has good and bad with it. And I just wanted to highlight all the good things that, that we were experiencing there, like the Royal But you weren't going to come Museum. in July. You're not going to come when the Oilers aren't playing, too, right? So probably the only trips you ever make to Edmonton, unless you come for the Stanley Cup final in June or something, uh, then it's going to be cold there. Like Edmonton has very hot summers. Um, yeah. But that's that's obviously not when uh, you would want to probably be there as a fan if you're going to pay all the money to come up here. Yeah, we def- like when we were in Banff, we had a lot of people you know, say like, oh, you got to come back in the summer. And it's like, well, yeah, I would, I would love to come see Lake Louise in the summer, but I'm here because the Oilers are playing. So it yeah. would be hard for me to justify spending all the money to go there. Everything Just else is sort of an extra. The The trip is yeah. centered around the Oilers games. Yeah. It's all, it's all just a window dressing, but it's, right. it's, it's the Oilers and then everything else. But I will say Banff is the most beautiful place I have ever seen in my entire life. Like I, yeah. we couldn't take enough pictures. Everything looked like a postcard. I've been to Colorado and like we've been to the top of Pikes Peak and, you know, s- seen all the, like the Rocky Mountains there and everything. Like it, it doesn't hold a candle to Banff. Like Banff is just in Lake Louise. Ryan just Smith's hometown un- in Banff too. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. And we, you know, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, we will definitely go back there. Like I said, I know, it, it we says just a lot. That I, pictures there. Yeah. And I mean, it's so picturesque. Uh, I, I will say I've only been to Lake Louise once and I've never been to Banff, which you know is pretty bad for me. I've lived in Western Canada for most of my life and uh, you've uh, seen a, more, more of the province in some ways than I ever have. But uh, I, I mainly was a uh, 
you know, if I come to Edmonton, it's for an Oilers game, and I went to university in Calgary for three years. So those are the the two places that I've spent the most amount of time. Uh, but no, I'm glad that you had such an amazing time in oil country and got to see uh, some of the biggest tourist attractions in the in the province. Uh, so I, and and just to say that it not only lived up to the expectations but exceeded them for you. It's uh, that's awesome to hear, man. Yeah, it so far exceeded you know anything we we could have had in mind. You know, and and there's just there were several things we didn't even get to do. You know, we didn't even go to West Edmonton Mall. Like that's. <laughs> It's like well, now you got to go back. You got to check. Edmonton, so now we, yeah, now we have to go back. But I mean, well, you want to skate on the rink in West Edmonton Mall too, right? Oh, I can't skate. That's what <laughs> I, I don't. I don't come from a hockey back. Right. I walked. I walked out on the on the rink, you know, next to Rogers to say I did okay. it. I did. I yeah. did tell my wife that's one of my uh, one of my goals is I'm going to learn how to skate before we come back because that it, I would like to skate out in front of Rogers, but. I'd be very but I'm cool. a barber, and I'm also terrified of falling and you know breaking my <laughs> wrist and being out of uh, yeah. Commissions. I so, I can uh, I can imagine how uh, you don't want to injure your tools there. So uh, yeah, and I'm also well, 35, so I feel like if it would have happened, it probably would have already happened by now. Uh, it's but, never too late to learn, though, right? Like uh, you I'll could, shuffle around out. You could shuffle with, around on a. You, no one's saying you have to go breakneck speed like Connor does out there, but you know, just to stand up on a pair of skates, you can hold on to the boards a little bit. Uh, no, that's, that's cool, man, to, to hear, you know, your passion for the team and how great of a time you had here and how there's still things that you want to see that you didn't get to. So that, that'll at least, uh, give you, if you didn't have a reason to come back already, which I, I know you do, it gives you even more incentive now. Yeah. And I have to say like the people there are the nicest people I have ever encountered in my entire life. Like we've, we've traveled quite like my in-laws live in Florida uh, like we just went to New York city, you know, in December, uh, we're in St. Louis all the time. We go to Chicago a lot. My half brother lives in uh, Los Angeles. So like we've been to a lot of places, right? There is nowhere that holds a candle to how nice. I mean, Canadians kind Antonio, of have a reputation. I haven't experienced Canadians as a whole, yeah. but they are the nicest people. Like they can't do enough for you. Like they just want to make sure like you're having a good time. Um, we were totally blown away by that. Like they just like every game we went to, there were people messaging me on Twitter, like, hey, you know, where are you sitting at? Let us buy you a beer. This oh, nice. this guy that owns a a couple steakhouses in, in Edmonton brought us a gift card, you know, wanted to buy us oh, dinner. Wow. Like these guys, they just couldn't do enough for us. Like I'd be walking around like like during intermittent, you know, in between periods, I'd have like two beers and some guys trying to buy me another one. It's like I'm okay, man. Like <laughs> I, I appreciate it so much. You're so nice. Um, but yeah, it's like, a very welcoming group uh, in oil country. Really, the only things that will uh, get uh, get Canadians angry at each other is uh, over their hockey teams. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's you to might be expected. You know, if you ever get a chance to go see a game uh, at the Saddle Dome, which I mean is a pretty old rundown arena in its own right, uh, uh, at least there will be a ton of Oilers fans there. But I think you'll see maybe a different side of Canadian hockey fans with all the chirps going back and forth between Oilers fans and Flames fans. For sure. Yeah, I would love to hit, you know, the other Canadian markets, you know, when the Oilers kind of roll through those towns. Um that would be really cool to experience. Probably, probably not. Yeah, like you said, not so welcoming there. I don't know that a a Leafs fan or a Canadians fan is going to be buying us any beers, but <laughs> probably not. But it would be it'd be really cool to experience that for sure. Yeah, um, but no, that's awesome, man. It's uh, like we said, go anytime that you're in Edmonton, you can feel the vibe, especially during the hockey season. And I know you've traveled across North America, like you said, and, and seen Oilers games in other cities, but um, it, it's like you basically laid out there. There's nothing that uh, compares to cheering for a team when you're in, when you're a home fan in their building. Yeah. It's just such a nice arena. Like it, it blows away. Like I've only been to four other hockey arenas. So it's not like I have a, a like a huge breadth of knowledge, but for Rogers is such a beautiful yeah. arena like one of the best in north america i would think oh my god it, it's it's just it's so awesome <laughs> like it 
it's it's constructed so beautifully it's set up so well inside um i mean it really revitalized the downtown too where rogers place stands now used to be the old greyhound bus depot and i can remember coming to edmonton in the early 2010s there was a couple times i because i was going to school in calgary where i bussed up to edmonton and met my family there who had driven from saskatoon uh to meet me for a game and um to see where downtown is now compared to 13 14 years ago i mean it's night and day you can't even compare it and it's done so much for the city and hopefully the nhl will reward edmonton with a an nhl all-star game or a draft coming up here because gary bettman did say that that would be next in line for the oilers when the entire arena district is completed and now that they've basically reached that point uh it would be great to see the entire league come and really get to experience uh all of what rogers place has to offer at one time yeah God forbid Gary Bettman showcase uh, Connor McDavid in his prime in the well, most beautiful arena in NHL. And you know, kind of off topic, like, but I mean, and I saw that they announced that the uh, the, the All Star Game in twenty seven is going to be in uh, Long Island, yeah, where everybody wants to go. <laughs> and I mean, look, you had the Heritage Classic jersey on when I met you. Um, I want to talk about jerseys again in a sec here, but. Um, the Oilers have played in two Heritage Classics now since McDavid's been in the league. Nine seasons, and they've put them on that stage only twice. I know that the Chicago Blackhawks are one of the biggest markets in the league. And yes, they were a dynasty in the early to mid-2010s. So there was a lot of reasons why they were playing in outdoor games every single year. But when you have a talent like Connor McDavid, you should be showcasing him as much as possible. It is a good step that the Oilers are actually on national television in the U S more than any other team in the league this year. I believe they had 18 nationally televised games uh, between ESPN and TNT, which is a good step in the right direction. I, I think that they, you know, needed to market him better earlier on. And I mean, you're already seeing that with Connor Bedard in Chicago that, you know, he's probably already getting uh, promoted better than McDavid did early in his career. But to only have McDavid play in one of these outdoor games twice, I would be getting him in one every single season. Do not miss an opportunity to have the Oilers play in one. And they don't all have to be at Commonwealth Stadium. You could have the Oilers playing Toronto. I mean, there's a a rivalry there even between Toronto and Edmonton fans, even though they're not in the same conference, just the Canadian uh, rivalry going back and forth between Austin Matthews and McDavid. You've got the two superstars who could go head to head. I would have them playing at the Blue Jay stadium at the Sky Dome. There's so many other opportunities you could do it. If Calgary had a better football stadium, you could have them playing there as well. But just while this guy is in his prime, showcase him as much as you can especially to the fans who don't get to see him very often yeah i mean i I don't know i mean it's it's a failure on the nhl's part really i mean it's it's like you said they've done a better job this year with with how like how often they're on national tv but i mean like that first game we went to in edmonton when they played the bruins like they're playing an original six team both contenders why is that game on at 10 o'clock Eastern time? Like why, yeah. why is, why are all of our games so late at night? Like, I mean, th- to some extent they do have to tailor to the local crowd, but you could still have a 7 PM start time in Edmonton, as opposed to an 8 PM, because if you're going to put the Oilers on at 8 PM in Edmonton, it's going to be 10 PM in you know, the Eastern time zone. So it makes it pretty hard to watch a player of that caliber when it's that late at night. And, you know, that's some of the reason why I don't think a lot of fans out East appreciate how great McDavid is because they're not seeing him play as often. They might see the highlights and look at the stats similar to Gretzky in the eighties. And even though he played for LA after that, uh, which obviously put him on a bigger platform than ever before. And, really helped grow the game in the States more than anything else, probably in the the last 30 years, if not ever. Um, But for McDavid to be playing in Western Canada that late at night, I can see how it might not catch as much attention 
in the eastern United States. But yeah, there are things that they could do to make make fans a little more aware, I would say, and try to bring in a, a wider audience. And the hour it would make all the difference because it it's would. not like, it, it, you you schedule it at eight, but it's not going to start till like eight twenty. Yeah, by the time the book actually drops. Um, and a lot of local fans would rather the game start at seven p.m. as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's much more manageable on a, a Wednesday night when you have to get up and work the next day, you know, or like yeah, the young. And even if they don't stay and watch the whole game. Honor. Yeah, Sorry, I mean, it's a, it's a big time. Yeah, I mean, if if you have kids that want to, you know, they want to watch McDavid, it's hard to do on a school night when it when the puck drops so late. Well, just look uh, at practice today. Did you see the video of Connor signing all those autographs for the kids in Buffalo? Yeah, that that was so cool. I mean, you he's a superstar. I mean, it's so cool that he, that he does that. Like you see those videos of him with kids all the time. He always takes time, um, to, to, to give them their moment. Uh, I mean, you think about it, best player in the world. He stayed on the ice reportedly 30 minutes after practice alone to work on his skills. So the best player in the world is also the hardest working guy on the team, putting in that extra time just to, stay at the level he's at and get better. That just shows his dedication to the sport. And then even after that, he gets off the ice and signs autographs for a bunch of kids. Um, I mean, just a, a first rate hockey player and human being. Yeah. And, and to do that, you know, like it says, save the extra time on the ice and, and you know, sign for the kids and, and spend time with them after how poorly they played last night, you know, <laughs> they have every reason to, you know, get get in their skate and go back to the hotel room or whatever. But the fact that he goes the extra mile to to give those kids their their moment. And when I'm you put the Oilers on at 10 p.m. at night, yeah, exactly. I mean, it makes it hard for those seven year old kids to stay up and watch it. But um, but yeah, it's just awesome to see you know how how devoted he is to you know, and, and re- really he understands what he means to the game. And I think that that's one of the biggest things. When you are on that level of a Wayne Gretzky, of a Connor McDavid, of a Sidney Crosby, the players who are generational talents, you recognize that you need to be the face of the sport and you have to make yourself available to the fans like that. And and I think that's one thing that has made all three of those guys um even bigger than what they contribute on the ice is what they're able to do off the ice too. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. He, he's very self-aware of what he means to the sport. Um, yeah. We're, we're just very blessed to have him on our team. And just before we move on, before I forget, we did talk about the heritage classic. I saw today that you tweeted a picture of a sports illustrated edition of Wayne Gretzky for uh, his farewell from 1999. I remember that cover so well. I think that we had it in the library at my elementary school when I was a kid and um, checking it out from the the library uh, to take it home and read it. And also just, I mean, looking through all the pictures from his career. And then uh, you also had a signed Paul Coffey jersey, which I thought was awesome. I have one as well. I was able to meet him back in 2012 when he came to my si- uh, city for a charity event. Um, and so he signed it in person for me. We got to take a picture together. So great to see that you have a, a coffee jersey now as well, too. Uh, obviously the best defenseman in Oilers history, one of the greatest defensemen in the history of the game. So I just wanted to say, I, I know you were wearing the Dry Sidle Heritage Classic jersey when we met up in Fort Hall. I still need to get one as well, uh, planning to on my next trip to Edmonton in April. So I just want to know, how many Oilers jerseys do you have? Uh, are they home or away, and uh, which players' names are, are on them? Oh, boy. Um Probably have ten right now. So I've got so Dry is my favorite player. So I've got his Heritage Classic. I've got his home jersey. I've got um, an away jersey of Stu Skinner. I love Stu. Uh, I've got Stu's All Star jersey from last year. I've got a uh, the old uh, copper and blue um, Ryan Smith jersey. I've got. The uh, reverse retro from last year. I've got a Darnell Nurse and I have a Connor McDavid. One of those. Um, when we, or I've, I've got uh, Connor's All Star jersey from this year as well. And when we were in Edmonton, I bought my wife a 
uh, Boosh away jersey. And then her favorite player is Evander Kane. So she's got an Evander Kane home jersey. I think, Thanks. yeah, I think you were telling me that. That's awesome. So the, the collection is growing. And I was going to ask what the next one would be. Obviously, it is a, a Paul Coffey jersey that you picked up today. Uh, where did you get that one from? Oh, I'm always on the prowl on uh, on eBay or or anything for. Yeah, I've got a few from vintage, eBay over the years too. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm starting to like build out on my, uh, like my basement wall. Like I have a lot of stuff in my office at uh, at my I own a barber school, so at my barber school I have a lot of stuff in my office, like memorabilia and stuff. But on my basement wall, I, I want to have like a a bunch of signed jerseys. So this is my. This is the first I'm one. Starting, yeah, I'm starting to get that going. Um, Are you going to get some frames for them too? Yeah, yeah, got to got to get them all framed up. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so I'm I'm starting to kind of, you know, work, work my way towards Build that the collection. For sure, they get a those can get more and more expensive though. For sure. <laughs> you know, I bought a I bought a signed Gretzky jersey back in 2009, and uh, so I was 20 at the time, and my my parents' neighbor actually owned a, a hockey shop in the mall that was near our house. And uh, he, he let me make installment payments on it. I was working part-time at Safeway at the time. So, you know, when you're making only like 10 bucks an hour as a, a university kid, it takes a little while to add up to buy a $1,000 jersey. So I'd make payments over time and eventually brought it home. And, you know, he... Uh, as a as a favor to me, which was pretty nice, he after I bought the jersey, he gave me the case for it for free, and I still have it to this day. It's like my most valuable possession. So, uh, be great to see a signed ninety nine on your wall as well. That was a pretty good investment. Those jerseys, it was, you know, man, I mean, gone up like exponentially. I I think like like I said, I got it for a thousand dollars in two thousand nine. I'd have to look at what a, a signed Gretzky jersey would be worth fifteen years later, but I'm guessing you could probably double that or more. Yeah, yeah, you're not going to find it for a thousand dollars, that's for sure. No, <laughs> um, but yeah, that sounds great, and you'll have to post some pictures uh, as the the den gets completed here. Yeah, I've 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 got some overflow now. Like I, I oh god, like every time we would go into the team store, I just couldn't couldn't contain myself. It was really cool because when we were there, I bought a, uh, I bought the Heritage Classic hat, and I wanted to get a. Right. It's like a cream color, and I wanted to get that because I, I wanted to get like all the 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 broadcasters to sign, you know, Jack Michaels and Louis Brusque and Bob Stoffer and Gene and all that. I wanted to get them to all sign it. So, oh, that'd got, be cool. I've got all of them. Um, I'm going to take it to St. Louis because I did not get to meet uh, Tony Barr, and I I need to get him on there. But it was really cool to meet Very all those cool. guys because they're they're like the the soundtrack to my my hockey. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, you met Gene a couple times, right? Didn't you meet him in St. Louis first? <laughs> yeah. So so where we were sitting, we were kind of in the corner of the rink, like above where the Zamboni comes out, and it was the game after the Red Wings when Connor had uh, six assists. So I was sitting up there with my wife and my parents, you know, and. I just happened to look down and I saw Gene standing there and he's holding a tray of six apples. And I was like, Oh my God, that's Gene. And I like ran down there. I was like, I have to get a picture with him. I ran down there and, uh, kind of had to weave through like some blues fan. They had no no idea who he was, but I had to like weave through some blues fans that, uh, you know, waited for him to finish his segment and just hollered at him, you know, took a picture with me and my wife. Uh, couldn't be a nicer guy. Like just, Every bit as nice, you know, in person as he is on TV. Uh, but yeah, he was gracious enough to 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 sign our our uh, little sticker. Um, got that on my wall right now. But it was funny because we were walking back to our seats and we we're like, people were asking us like, "Who is that guy and why is he holding a tray of apples?" So kind of had to kind of had to explain, you know, Gene. because he's a legend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like you don't know. You're in the you don't know the bits. Legend, right? Yeah, you don't know the, the the gimmicks that are going on. Honestly, I can tell you, there is not a single person in the broadcasting industry or fans of the team who will say a bad word about Gene. Uh, he is just a great human being. Um, he's actually, he came on my show about a year ago, last April, and it's the most listened to episode of the show ever. And I, I'm so glad that uh, he was willing to do that and give me some of his time. And, you know, 
uh, he's a busy guy, and it was during the Stanley Cup playoffs. I think the Oilers were... No, it wasn't. The playoffs hadn't been going on. The Oilers were on the road, but it was right before the playoffs started. And, you know, for him to take the time to, uh, you know, call in and, and just uh, be on the show and um, it, it just kind of shows what a what a tremendous guy he is that, you know, he'll still take the time and uh, be on a fan podcast here and just kind of talk about the team and his memories. It's, it's one of my favorites that I've ever done as well. And, yeah, I, I'd love to talk to him again. I, I, I could have talked to him for three hours probably but i didn't want to keep them that long so uh yeah just uh if anyone wants to go back and listen to an old episode of the show i would highly recommend that one yeah i mean he just brings like so much levity to to the, the broadcast like, oh yeah you know he's got his little like uh hokey little jokes or whatever but he's the prince of he, puns <laughs> absolutely he, he kind of brings you down to earth you know after a bad period you know just watching some of the some of Gene's uh, humor um, kind of puts things into perspective. Like, you know, it's, it is just a game, you know, we'll be all, all right. But uh, and no, and knowing we're, we're team, very fortunate to have the, the broadcast team we do. Like, I think Jack Michaels is just the best in the business. I oh. absolutely love Stauffer. I love Lou. No one love matches Gene. Jack's uh, intensity. And uh, yeah. especially when it's a tight game late in the third period. Um, I mean, Jack Michaels could read the phone book and make it exciting. Even even last night, you know, before they scored the empty netter, like he starts cranking it up as it mm-hmm. gets closer, you know, to the end. And it's just, it's like his overtime calls are just like legendary. Like he has to start calling the playoffs. I, I, I wish that sports would put him. I know that like he he does have still a contract with the radio station, and of course, Oilers games like he is the regional play by play commentator or play by play guy. So. Uh, playoffs are all national games and you know as much as I like the other guys who get the chance to do play by play in the playoffs when you have a guy who's devoted all year long and is with the team from the start of the season right to the end there's a lot more investment than someone who just comes in to call a game on hockey night in Canada once a week or once every two weeks so I, I think that for Oilers fans, they would really enjoy getting to see Jack do the games as well. And, you know, much like Rod Phillips, who was the Oilers legendary play by play voice for 37 years before Jack Michaels took over, fans used to literally mute the TV and listen to Rod call the games on the radio. Oh, that's what I do now. Like, because, <laughs> you know, if they play the Blues or the Blackhawks, like, I can't get the Oilers feed. You know, right. if they're on national TV, you know, you get whatever broadcast team is announcing. I can't, it's nothing against them. I just, I choose not to listen to them. So six thirty, Chad goes on my phone and I watch the games on mute. Like I, they're, they're just, they're just the best in the business, but it's, yeah. there's also like you were saying, they're around the team every day. They have more insight than, you know, a national broadcast. And so much more invested. I mean, than a guy who comes in to call the games every once in a while, someone who's there for all 82 games, someone who actually is there from the start of training camp, really, they're calling all the preseason games and still calling the playoff games on the radio. Jack Michaels has been in Edmonton for 14 years now. He's been there right from the start of the Taylor Hall, Jordan Eberle days in, uh, in 2010, all the way through. I mean, this guy is so ingrained in Edmonton and um, as great as Rod Phillips was and that left a legacy that many believe will never be matched. Uh, Jack Michaels has come in and done an amazing job filling those shoes. Yeah. And it, you know, like, like Gene Prince is like a university of Alberta guy. Like the, just a lot of the broadcast guys are just like embedded in that community. And I think that yeah. just makes it, you know, that much, that much better. It's like more personal for them. Oh, yeah, they they love the city of Edmonton, and Gene is born and raised in Edmonton. And, I mean, for him to have the chance to cover his hometown team for the bulk of his broadcasting career, and, uh, you know, he could have gone on and done other things. He he would have had other opportunities to go to bigger markets, but uh, the fact that he chose to stay in Edmonton and be the, the host for this team, it just shows how important this city and how important this team really is to him. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we're, we're very fortunate to have, to have those guys to listen to every day. 
Definitely. And uh, let's talk about the current state of the team now, just to close out the show tonight. Uh, the Oilers acquired three new players this week in Adam Henrique, Sam Carrick, and Troy Stetcher for draft picks without having to send out any players off their active roster. With these additions, as well as Corey Perry back in January, are you more confident in the team going into the playoffs than you were a year ago? Yes, I am. Um, I mean, there's people complain. There's always more that that you hope that they would get, right? But like, I think when you look at you know, like what like the Avalanche did, or what Vegas did, or you know what the Canucks did, I I think that the the Oilers are starting at a different point than they are. Like I, I think the Oilers are kind of the hunted. Um, and maybe that's just my homerism talking, but you don't go on a 16 game heater, you know, and be like a mediocre team. Like you can't cover that many flaws. Like you don't, you don't turn around on a two, nine and one start to have the best record in hockey since early November. Like that doesn't only one team in the history of the league. That's had a longer winning streak. So it just kind of tells you how, how great I mean, of a run they had. The run they're on right now is the best such run in any point in Oilers history. Yeah, like over I the past people, 40 games, I think. Yeah, people lose lose sight of that. So, I mean, every team is going to have a bad period, a bad stretch, a bad game. You know, if, even when I was in Edmonton, I mean, they, they went 1-2-1. One, and one. You know, they didn't look great for a, a few of those games. You know, that's, that's, just, that's just how it goes. But, uh... I, I feel really good about the team, you know, going in to the playoffs. Like, I don't know how much more you could ask of, of Stu Skinner. I mean, right. The guy has been like Vesna caliber after that rough start. Uh, he's really locked it down. Um, I love his demeanor. Like he's way mature beyond his years. Like he just doesn't get rattled. Uh, I mean, you love to see that mental confidence from such a young goaltender still. Yeah, even when he has a rough game, like he stands in front of the press, he answers the questions, um, he doesn't shy away from it, and he's just like, it's just on to the next. You know, he, he just doesn't get hung up. Like, you know, it's really remarkable to watch um, and to see and that. He's been thrust such into young, the starter's role way earlier than expected. Let's not forget, he was supposed to be Jack Campbell's backup for two or three years and then maybe start splitting time with him and eventually take over the starters net. But early on in year one of Campbell's tenure with the Oilers, he had to take over this role as the starting goalie at 23 years old and just trying to make his way in the league. And okay, now the the crease is yours, kid. (laughs) That's a, a lot to ask of a rookie goalie. And what did he do? He backstopped the Oilers to another second place finish in the Pacific Division and won a series in his first year, uh, was an NHL All-Star. And I remember that year because I went to Ryan Smith's um, Oilers Hall of Fame night. And in that game, the Oilers had a 3-2 lead in the third period, and the Devils scored two goals in seven seconds, I believe. And it was just two bang-bang goals. And just like that, a 3-2 lead turned into a 4-3 loss. And basically exactly what you just said. He stood in front of the press after the game. This is still in his rookie year. He probably had, oh, about 15 games of NHL experience at the time. And just basically said, yeah, you know, I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to be better for it. And that is the type of maturity and just calmness that you want to see from your goaltender. And if he has that at 23 years old, you can imagine, you know, what he's going to look like when he's been in the league for five years. Yeah. I mean, goalies take longer to, to kind of find their footing in, in season. Like, like he's this level already. Like we're yeah. in, we're very fortunate and he's a hometown kid. I mean, exactly. I mean, how, like, how cool is that? The, the, the team that you grew up cheering for, I mean, uh, you know, he would have been eight years old, uh, or not even seven years old during that cup run in 06. And I think he talked about being a big Dwayne Rollison fan at the time. And just to now you're in that spot where you were this little kid watching Rollison take the Oilers on this miracle run to the final. Now you're in that role. You're the guy who's backstopping your hometown team and trying to do the exact same thing. 
I mean, he must be just having the time of his life. And um, looking at the guys we brought in, like, really, this team has been upgrading year over year since the 2020 playoffs when they lost to the Chicago Blackhawks in stunning fashion. It was a, you know, a very disappointing update during that bubble playoff run in Edmonton. But since then, they they continue to add pieces in 2021, 2022, 2023, bringing in Zach Hyman, Evander Kane. Uh, Matthias Ekholm, now Corey Perry, just they already have their game breakers in Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. And yes, it would be great if they could have went out and got a Vladimir Tarasenko or uh, Pavel Buchnevich on this uh, deadline. But if those guys have a no trade list or they're not willing to come here or the teams are asking for too big of a package in return, there's only so much you can do there. So I, I think that adding some pieces that filled the holes that they needed to in the top six, like both forwards they brought in, uh, they can kill penalties. They're both centers. And right now the Oilers are loaded down the middle. They have so many different center options. So even if someone gets injured, they have someone who can fill in a spot. They can also uh, move some guys around the lineup, which allows them to have greater depth. And I think having Henrique as a third line center who can, on occasion, come up and play second line wing if he has to. That's so valuable for this team. Uh, Sam Carrick is like a younger, quicker, uh, bigger version of Derek Ryan. So, uh, you know, you, you don't have to have him in the lineup every night, but he and Ryan could sort of trade in and out there. Stetcher gives them more depth on defense, and he might not be the, you know, the blue line addition they were looking for and Holland certainly has come under some criticism from a good portion of the fan base for not addressing arguably the Oilers biggest area of need before the deadline which is a legitimate top four shutdown defenseman um, but you know considering how few options there were to upgrade over Cody CC on the market this year do you think that some fans are being too harsh on Holland or do you think that they're justified in their criticism of him I mean, I think they're being too hard. I mean, CC is a plus defender. I mean, he plays 20 minutes a night. Like it's, you don't just find those guys like, and there's something to be said for like continuity. Like these guys have history. I mean, that's why they didn't want to like ship any players on the roster out. It seems anyways, like the players didn't want to lose. Like yeah, those when you're a contending guys. team, you don't want to lose any pieces from your roster for sure. No. And I'm not saying like, CC is 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 he's not know, the, the be all best. end all on the back end, right? I mean, oh, no, he's not. But we could do a lot worse, a hell of a lot worse. I mean, he's yeah. he's he gets a bad rap, you know. Like he he makes mistakes. I mean, Bouchard made made a couple terrible mistakes yesterday, but Bouchard a, probably makes up for it a little more because he's an elite offensive defenseman. You know, Cody CC doesn't have that aspect to his game so when if he does make a mistake it seems maybe more glaring and bush still even takes you know a lot of flack for uh, times he coughs off the puck but when you're a defenseman who always has the puck on your stick you're more likely to turn it over as well too i just think that you look at cc yeah he, he might be playing a little over his head as a top pairing defenseman next to darnell nurse and they yeah they probably could find a a better player to fit in that spot. But for what he's giving you, I, I just think he, he gets the job done often enough. It, it would just be nice to have him maybe playing a little lower in the lineup so that he didn't have to go up against the opposition's top attackers night after night, because that's where he gets a little bit exposed playing against Colorado or Vegas or Dallas and having to defend against their, you know, top scores if you could have him going up against second or third liners more op often than not, I think that we probably wouldn't be hearing as much about him. Yeah, and I think that's why they're kind of shuffling the deck now. with uh, Giving Vinny a little bit more of a look. Yeah. And I think that also led to some people thinking that CC would eventually get moved because they were sort of testing out how much DNA can handle playing with Nurse and, you know, do we need someone to come in? And who knows, maybe Troy Stetcher will slide into that spot. This is a guy who has played in the playoffs before. Um, I think he actually was on Calgary when the Oilers played against them uh, in the 2022 playoffs. He was on the Kings too when they played. Yeah. So they, they know what he brings to the table. And Holland, 
you know, he he's somewhat uh, hands um, had his hands tied a little bit, and you can you can say it's his own fault for the contracts he's made of how much room he left himself. But I would say that for a team that had to be money in, money out for the most part, he did pretty good work this year. Uh, obviously, yes, they they would have liked the the big name, but Chris Tanev, they offered a first round pick for him. He would have been the ideal player to slide in next to Nurse, and I think that he would have made the Oilers a lot tougher to play against. But if Calgary wasn't willing to deal with the Oilers, yeah. then what can you do there? And I guess they could. Gonna, they were never going to send him here. No, and could they have gone out and got Sean Walker, Alexander Carrier? Yeah, I guess sure, but. Are you willing to pay the assets for what it would cost to bring those guys in for a marginal upgrade over CC? Sometimes it's just better to go with what you have. And I know that he's very well liked in the room. He's a good friend with Connor as well. So if you got a guy who fits well with the team, can make the steady safe play more often than not, but yeah, it does get exposed that time, like I said, against elite offensive players. I don't know. I would rather spend the assets somewhere else than just getting a minor upgrade. If you're going to bring in a defenseman that's going to take his spot on the team, you want it to be a slam dunk, home run, surefire guy who can come in there and you know can handle top minutes playing with Nurse. Someone who is going to be a significant upgrade, not someone who's just slightly better than him. Yeah, and 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 to do it on the floor, I mean, they only have four <laughs> weeks. I mean. It's got to happen quick. I mean, it's 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 not just bringing in new pieces and shipping new ones out and like it automatically works. You know, yeah. sometimes the sometimes the ingredients look good on paper, but they just don't mix right. Right, um, and th- and there still is twenty two games remaining this season. So I'm glad that all of the new players coming in have a little more than a quarter of the season to sort of get adjusted to their new surroundings, playing with a new team, and I think that a lot of the guys coming in are going to be really excited too, because all of these players were going to miss the playoffs if they didn't get dealt to Edmonton. They were all playing on teams near the bottom of the league. And uh, you look at a guy like Adam Henrique, he went to the Stanley cup final with the New Jersey devils in his rookie year. And prior to that, he won back to back Memorial cup championships with the Windsor Spitfires. So he comes out of junior as a two time champion, almost wins the Stanley cup in his rookie year in the NHL. And then all of a sudden, he doesn't make the playoffs again for six years, and he hasn't made it again for now six years after that. So we're talking about 14 years in the league, and he's made two playoff appearances. You can't tell me that this guy at 34 years old isn't going to be extremely motivated to make the most of this opportunity to play in the playoffs. Yeah, and and all the interviews I, I've listened to about Henrik and, uh, and Carrick is like they're both high-character guys. Like very, very much team first guys. Like they play well in the locker room. You know, Enrique is, he's willing to play, you know, center or like anywhere in the lineup, up and down the lineup. He, he really doesn't care. Like he's just team first, whatever, whatever the team needs. Yep. I like you know. the, I like, I mean, you saw, you saw Carrick last night drop the gloves. Like I, I love, what I he, saw your tweet about it. <laughs> I, I love that he brings, I mean, that's what they need. They need guys like that. Um, and he cracked him pretty good. <laughs> Uh, he knocked his helmet off with one big shot. Yeah, he he cracked him pretty good. But I mean, th- they need that sort of stuff. Like, I I like what those two guys you know bring to the table. Um, and then you look at, I mean, Winnipeg traded for Tyler Toffoli today, and I think they gave up a second and third round pick. And there were some fans on Twitter saying, "Oh, why did Holland give up a first round pick for two depth pieces from Anaheim when we could have given up a second and a third to get Toffoli?" Well. I mean, Toffoli is only two years younger than Henrik, so they're both kind of older players as they're, you know, early 30s. Um, and while Toffoli has more goals than uh, Henrik this year, uh, Henrik still is pretty close in terms of points. Like, Toffoli has 44 points in 61 games. Uh, Henrik has 60 points, or sorry, 42 points in 60 games. And he, he does other things that the team really needed, like killing penalties, uh, he provides even strength scoring as well. So it's not a guy that needs to be on the power play to contribute. He's on pace for 25 goals this year. And if he can give the bottom six a kind of some offensive punch, 
that will make him very valuable to this team. And like I said, also winning faceoffs, being solid defensively. It just makes the Oilers a lot deeper down the middle, especially when they go up against some of the tougher teams in the Western Conference in the playoffs. And I think like their salary retention on both. I think I think Henrik's seventy. Yeah, he came retained. at seventy five. Like, he's he's only a one point four million dollar player. Yeah, I think Carrick is fifty percent retained. Like you have to pay up when like we're in we're in we're in the cap situation we're in. Yeah. Like, it costs what it costs, you know. I mean when you can get a twenty five goal scorer for one point four million, that's pretty good value. Yeah. And it I just mean, it, it didn't seem like they were willing to give up like Holloway or Broberg. No, I, and I'm glad them, they didn't. You need them both next year. You need cheap, young, uh, you know, reliable contributors. And th- I mean, they're both going to be on the team next year. They're both. They gonna are. Be, and I think that Bob Stoffer. Yeah, Stoffer kind of telegraphed that a while ago that he sees. Uh, Broberg being a regular player next season, which makes some people think that, okay, well, maybe Brett Kulak is going to get moved in the summer just to clear a spot for him. Um, And it would make sense to have, you know, if Broberg can give the Oilers exactly what Kulak gives them for uh, a third of the cost, then that makes sense from an Oilers perspective to save a little bit of cap there. But, you know, Broberg reportedly was seeking a trade earlier this season, and if they did have to move him, <clears throat> it would it would really suck to have to give up a, a former eighth overall pick, you know, as sort of a throw-in in, in some deal. So you'd like that player, even if he doesn't live up to his draft hype, or uh, I guess, I mean, he was picked higher than he was supposed to, so I, I guess I should say his draft position. You you want him to still be an effective player for this team when you have a top ten pick like that. I mean, Bru, uh, Bouchard was also a tenth overall pick, and he's turned into an elite offensive defenseman. But you're not going to turn every single pick in that range into a premier player. But you want to make sure that it, if you're picking that high in the draft, it's at least someone who can contribute to their team. And and I think that Broberg is someone who could do that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I- I, I expect him to be be a very solid contributor next year. I mean, Dylan Holloway too. Like, I he has so much potential. I mean, he's just he's just still putting it all together. And I know they shipped him back to to Baco, and I I think that'll be good for him. He actually scored a goal during the recording of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you don't want him here just playing like nine minutes a night. That's really not what he needs. He needs to be down there playing, you know, twenty twenty five minutes a night. You know, and look, maybe what he needs. And, and, and come this fall, if he comes into training camp and has a good tra- camp, maybe he gets a look on Dreisaitl's line to start the season. Because you're starting to see around the league more and more younger players getting these opportunities. And if you can have a guy like Holloway turn into a 20-goal scorer for you, playing alongside Dreisaitl or McDavid, that helps so much to have a guy who's under a million dollars a year and giving you top six level production. Because you've got these high contracts, and McDavid and Drysaddle are going to make even more in the years to come. So, and, and of course, look at Bouchard; he's due for a raise uh, the year after next as well. So, with these contracts coming up, where the top players are going to get paid and paid significantly, having a guy like Holloway who can be a good contributor for you on a cheap deal just means so much to this team. Yeah, and I, I mean, I know, like, yes, it's definitely an all-in year, but you, you can't be totally negligent like you 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 need those types of players right like i mean like you mentioned right. so like you got to pay leon next year you know connor's got two years you know bushy has got a couple years skinner's got a couple years like all of these guys are going to need paid you know you you, you, you just you want the cap to keep going up too that's a big yeah. thing and, and now that we're out of the pandemic let's hope that happens if it continues to rise five percent every year as it should then the Oilers should be okay because it's going to jump to eighty-seven and a half million this year, a four million dollar jump, and let's say it climbs again to uh, ninety-two million the year after that. Well, that's when Drysaddle's a free agent, so you want to make sure that you can afford that, even though he could sign an extension as early as this summer. And what if he asks for fourteen million? And I think he probably will because you look at. Austin Matthews got 13.25, which kicks in a year from now. That will make him the highest paid player in the league for one year after McDavid was the highest paid player for about five or six years at 12 and a half. 
So now Leon jumps up to 14. Well, what does Connor make the year after that? Because he left money on the table in 2017. Let's not forget that. The Oilers reportedly offered him $15 million a year, but he wasn't comfortable taking that much. So he left two and a half on the table, settled at 12.5, which is an even $100 million contract over eight years. I think that McDavid would probably be in the 16 to $17 million range. And really, if he wanted 20, the Oilers would give it to him. But I think it'll be another situation where he'll say, I want to stay competitive. I want this team to have extra money to bring in another Zach Hyman, another Evander Kane. If, if you want to have these types of players being added to your roster year over year, uh, sometimes it's incumbent on the, the top guys to leave a little bit. So I think that you could see a situation where McDavid's making 17 and Dreisaitl's making 14. And they would be worth every dollar. But you still have your two best players making a combined $31 million a year. And even if the salary cap is close to $100 million by then, that's still 30% of your cap locked up in two players. So just tying this all back to what we're talking about, if you can have guys like Broberg and Holloway who are contributing on cheap contracts, it's so valuable to a team that has these very high-earning players. Yeah. And Connor and Leon are going to get whatever they want. I mean, you 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 couldn't yeah, pay. You, you pay them. Connor's worth every. I mean, Connor's probably been worth a billion dollars to this franchise since he, he came. will. And and it's funny because I I've heard Bob Stoffer actually say that on his show that by the time McDavid's career in Edmonton is over, he will have just himself made the team a billion dollars. There's no question. And, you know, he should have a quarter of a billion of career earnings by then. And, uh, I mean, I hope he plays until he's 40 and has 22 seasons in Edmonton. Um, hope he wins close to 10 scoring titles, gets 2,000 career points, um, and is widely considered the second greatest player of all time behind only Wayne Gretzky by the time he hangs up his skates. But he needs some Stanley Cups in there. And uh, that's the that's the next thing that uh, he has to check off his list because from an individual standpoint, he's done everything there is to do. He's won every award. He's recorded 150 points in a season, a 60 goal season. He'll do that more times in his career. But the one thing that he really wants is that cup. Yeah, and that's and he's said as much. You know, this year, like been there, done that. You know, that's that's his quote. I mean, but. He can do what, it, like, if he wants to score sixty goals, he'll score sixty goals. Like, well, this year it's a hundred like, assists like, is the target. You know, yeah, that's like, the... he, he, like he said it, you know, facetiously a couple of weeks ago. Like, I'm just not going to shoot it. <laughs> exactly. Anymore. It's like he I'm... really just does whatever he feels like doing. You know, I mean, I know that's like a little bit of hyperbole, but but he's just that transcendent of a talent. Um, he is, and he knows that this is the only place where he can play with Leon. Like that's it. Too. You can't go anywhere else and play with Leon, and Leon knows he isn't going anywhere else and playing with a McDavid. The only I just place that could fit them, them under the cap is here. So, I, and they're such close friends, and they're the, like we said, two of if not the two best players in the league. You're never going to have a better opportunity to like C- Connor will never play with another player as good as Leon, and yeah. Leon will never play with another player as good as Connor. So why would they not stay together and, and do it here? And um, you know, I, I give it about a, a 97% chance that they both resign. Um, and, you know, despite the Oilers disappointing 4-2 loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets last night, Connor McDavid recorded his 100th point of the season with an assist on Zach Hyman's 43rd goal of the season. McDavid joined Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Marcel Dion, Mike Bossy, and Peter Stastny as the only players in NHL history with seven 100-point seasons. And if not for the COVID pandemic back in 2020, he would be at eight consecutive 100-point seasons right now. Uh, Brandon, first off, what can you say about the dominant offensive run he's been on since getting healthy in late November to reach 100 points in only 59 games? It's the third time in the past four years where he's hit the century mark in under 60 games. And secondly, do you think sometimes we take for granted that we're watching one of the all-time greats in his prime? I mean, you could definitely tell in the beginning of the year that he wasn't quite right. I mean... I remember the, I can't remember who it was against, but that was like our first overtime loss of the year. Winnipeg. He, he yeah, got, he didn't He, got, he got a, a abdominal, abdominal strain or oblique strain in that game. Yeah, it was before uh, the Heritage Classic. Yeah, and I was getting a little stressed there. It was about eight days before, 
and I thought that uh, I wasn't going to get to see McDavid in that game. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of TV execs were very stressed. Too. <laughs> but uh, you could just tell he just wasn't wasn't quite right. But yeah, ever since he's gotten healthy, he's really his game's just it's evolved so much. Like he's much more physical this year, uh, like noticeably more physical than, than any other year. Um, and there's times like you get frustrated because he doesn't shoot and like he, he might have might be the better option. Uh, but he's just always so concerned with getting his teammates involved. And I mean, you, you've heard like Hyman speak, like this is why he came to Edmonton to play with, with Connor McDavid. Um, you know, like he's been the direct recipient of, of, of his sort of, uh, selfless play, you know, um, he, he just, his high, his hockey IQ is just off the charts. Like his vision is just off the charts. Um, and that's why I say like, he can, kind, he just kind of does what, whatever he wants. Like last year, like Leon said, you need to score 60 this year. And, and he, he scored, did it. Like he scored, scored 60. So I think this is more like in his game to 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 defer to his teammates a little bit more. Um, I wish he would be a l- little bit more, you know, selfish at times. Like I think, la- well, like we did see him night. shooting a lot more, and and I honestly wonder if that uh, if that injury that he had to his obliques back in the fall is still affecting his ability to shoot the puck a little bit because you know it's a motion when you're shooting the puck. It's a motion that's constantly turning your body and you don't really get any opportunity to fully heal it when you're always doing that. So it might take until the off season for him to fully get right in that aspect. But I mean, there's no reason to doubt that he couldn't score 60 goals again next season. Yeah. And it's really like you talk about like the points race, you know, when he, I mean, he's back in it. (laughs) Yeah. When we went from two, nine and one, I don't know how far he was down it. It was, he was. Not, I don't was, think he was in the top 100 in the league at the time. He was actually under a point per game for the first time first since time. his rookie season. Yeah. Uh, when he was 18 years old, there was a point where he was 12 points in 13 games. It was actually the game when he got hurt against the Flyers and broke his collarbone. But not since then had he been under. And it really turned around for him on American Thanksgiving when the Oilers beat the Washington Capitals 5 nothing on the road. And in that game, McDavid picked up four assists. And since then, he has 84 points in his last 43 games, which is a 160-point pace over a full season. So he's even scoring at a higher rate than he was last year when he had 153 points in 82 games. So he's still continuing to get better at age 27. And if he's healthy all year next year, I think that he could average or sorry, I think he could hit 164 points, which would mean that he averaged a full two points for a full season. And only Gretzky and Lemieux have done that before. Yeah, I absolutely think that's that's well within his reach. You know, no no doubt about it. And, you know, we talk about how significant 150 points is. I mean, he was one of only six players that has, have ever done that. And most of the players who accomplished that goal did it in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. It hadn't been done in nearly 30 years. And then in this era of more coaching, more defensive systems, you know, tighter hockey, for him to put up that many points in this era is just truly remarkable. And how is he going to follow up that 150-point season last year with a 100-assist season this year? And it's something that I predicted before the season on this podcast. We did our bold predictions, and that was one of mine that he did 100 assists and. Uh, he's trending in the right direction. I believe as of right now, he's on pace for 104 assists. And remember, he missed two games as well. So if he would have had those games back, it would even be more likely that he would have done it. Uh, So right now, he is currently on pace in 80 games for 105 assists. So, (laughs) you know, uh, he might only be on pace for about 32, 33 goals this year. But uh, we'll look back on this season as one of the best of his, in his career if he ends up uh, putting up 100. We, t- we just talked about 100 points. If he gets 100 assists, I mean, this will be one of his all-time great seasons as well. Yeah, and the second part of your question is like, you know, do you kind of become numb to watching this right. nightly? Is, you know, when I turn on a, like another another team's game, like in the NHL, it's 
so much less entertaining than <laughs> because, watching the Oilers. So much slower in a lot of cases. And there are great uh, players around the league. Let's not yeah, deny not, that. But there's any yeah. There's there's, there's nothing talent. like Connor. I mean, Nathan McKinnon and uh, Nikita Kucherov are amazing players. They are super elite players in this league. They've both won Stanley Cups. You know, they're they're both. Uh, perennially near the top of the scoring race, but McDavid is just on another level than every other superstar in the league. Yeah, but you ask uh, 32 GMs and they take Connor McDavid. 10 they would. 10 every every GM in the league would start a franchise with him if given the opportunity. Yeah, so I mean, I, I try to always remind myself like how, how fortunate we are to, to watch this guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes when I talk... He just does something every night that that you you just can't believe just blows us away does. you know <laughs> yeah like i i just never quite get immune to that um so yeah i mean we'll definitely look back at his time you know in this uniform as as some glory yeah. years sure I mean, the, the fact that the oilers in a span of 40 years had wayne gretzky and Connor mcdavid both spend their prime years in edmonton for fans of a certain vintage who are old enough to remember both of them that's so special that they got to do that. I just remember the tail end of Gretzky's career when he was with the New York, uh, Yang- or, sorry, the York with the New York Rangers. Um, but to think of like what it was like to see him during the mid '80s when he was putting up 200 plus points a season and just leading the Oilers on these incredible runs to the Stanley Cup year after year, uh, it would have been so. I, I can't even think of the words to say how special that would have been to see that on a consistent basis. O- Oilers fans were treated to some of the greatest hockey the game has ever seen. And now here we are in the 2020s and getting to see another player, not quite on the level of Gretzky because no one will ever be Gretzky, but the fact that you're seeing a player who's as close to it maybe as the game has seen since then, it's uh, it's just remarkably lucky how how fortunate Edmonton has been to have both of these players uh, spend their best years in this city. Yeah, it's hard to say, you know, that he's the great. But like what Stoffer says, I think is true. The, like the most, the most technically advanced, advanced or most player. evolved. Yeah, yeah, it's different I, I, though, right? I mean, it's so hard to compare players from different eras. I mean, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, didn't work out and, you know, didn't have a nutritionist and yeah. didn't have the modern advancements uh, in equipment or coaching that, that players have now. So in terms of just like pure abilities, McDavid has the greatest range of skills that we've ever seen. I think that Gretzky's greatness will always last till the end of time, though. I mean, the smartest player who ever played the game, no one ever passed the puck better than him. No one ever thought the game better than him. But just in terms of like a pure talent, McDavid is probably right up there with Mario Lemieux as the, you know, the, the best or second best um, talent the game has ever seen. Yeah, and to do it in an era where, like you said, I mean, it's a athletes, lower scoring the era. They're so much better. The goalies yeah. are so much better. Everybody's so much faster. Like the systems are so much more refined. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the Jordan and LeBron argument, you know? Yeah. It's two different eras. It's hard to compare the two. And I guess you living close to Chicago would also sort of, you know, you're probably hearing that maybe more often than, I mean, it's talked about out up here too, but I'm sure it's getting a lot more play in the States. Oh yeah, I mean, I I grew up in Illinois in the '90s with Michael Jordan, so like that's you heard a that, lot of that, that. That was the that was the end all be all right there. But so I mean, you're probably not growing up around anyone, or, or I should say, you're not around too many people now that are uh, in favor of LeBron in that argument. No, I mean, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, they always point to the to the rings, you know. But yeah. but it's there's something to be said about his longevity i mean the guy is just an elite athlete and has been doing it at this level for 20 years now i mean how you come in with the expectations he has and exceed every one of them it's 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 impossible definitely but you know just just to bring it back to mcdavid for a second i think he does have some of that jordan in him that that drive to win you know that that internal fire that just you know, that they hate to lose so much. And um, 
if McDavid finally does get to a Stanley Cup final this year, you know, Jordan never lost when he got to the final. And I, I just feel like when McDavid gets there, he's not going to let that opportunity miss. Yeah, I, I totally feel I totally feel that you can see like as the years of the playoffs go by, how much really him and Dry like their disdain for losing. Like mm-hmm. they they just have such a hunger to win. Um and I they want to win here. I mean I, they they That's want it. To, they want to do it here. They said there's it. something they there's something about your last, legacy. Uh, you know, th- to do it yeah. where you started, right? And I mean, I know if we want to go back to a basketball thing, I know LeBron did come back to Cleveland and win a championship there, but you know, he won championships in Miami first. And, you know, for someone like Jordan who started with the bulls and where they were at in the mid 1980s to bring them up to being the greatest dynasty, arguably in, in basketball history in the 1990s, it kind of shows, you know, that probably played a big part in why he's viewed by most as the greatest, that he took that team from where they were at and became champions. And for McDavid, he could go somewhere else and win a cup and it would be great, but it will never be as great as doing it where he started with the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. And and I, I just hope so badly, like that this is just where he spends his whole career. Yeah. I think that would just be so special. Um, I mean, Gretzky never wanted to leave here. I mean, it, there's just something, there's something to be said about spending your entire career in one place. Yeah. You know, going through like the entire process of, of losing, losing, and then breaking through, like winning a series, winning a couple rounds, making it to a conference final, making it to a cup final and, and doing it with, with, you know, teammates that you've been through the ringer with. Uh, I just hope so badly that that's, that that's the trajectory that we're on. Um, I just can't, he has everything he could ever want here. Like I, I, I don't see any way he he would ever leave this place. He has an owner that is willing to do anything for him. Like he has I mean, all the, the amenities the C- he could ever want. The CEO of the team is his former agent. Uh, the the coach of the Oilers is his former junior coach since he was 15 years old in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, all of his best friends are here. His girl, or I should say, his fiance, just opened up a new uh, interior design business in Edmonton. They built a home here. Uh, he's been in the city for almost a decade now. Uh, this guy is ingrained into Edmonton. And I mean, even though he still makes Toronto his off season home, you know, there's nowhere else. I think that he would rather play than right here. And every time McDavid's ever been questioned over the years about it, and it always seems to come up whenever the Oilers are kind of on a downswing, you know, uh, uh, you know, has your confidence in the group waned or anything? And he always has maintained this is where I want to be. This is where I want to win. And I think that from an Oilers perspective, that does calm the the fans nerves a little bit, but uh, ultimately putting a winning team on the ice is the number one thing that he wants. And as long as they continue to do that, I can't see him wanting to go anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, you, that's all you can ask for as an athlete is just, you want to be in contention every year and that's, they're in that window right now. I mean, what, what more could you really want? And I, I always, I love that interview this this season when uh, when Paige was interviewing him on ice, and he he gave that answer of like hopefully a lot more uh, points or wins in a, in an Oilers uniform, and the crowd went yeah. crazy. And he gave that little smirk. I was like, oh, you're never leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so it was so perfect in that moment. But I, I he he has a genuine love for this city and this team. I mean, it's uh, like we said, they're both connected here and you put it so well that there's only one place in the league where they could play together and it's right here in uh, Edmonton. And Brandon, I just want to say thanks so much for being on the show tonight. Uh, It's been just awesome talking to you for the past two hours. Um, Where can people find you on Twitter? Yeah, so uh, my handle is uh, S-U-A-R-K-88. So my last name is Kraus. Uh, so it's just my last name backwards. Okay. So it's, yeah. <laughs> I should have <laughs> you know, put that together. <laughs> I, I, I should have picked something that rolled off the tongue a little bit better than this, but uh, I made it many years ago, so this is what we got. At so, first yeah, I thought just... Suark was your last name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, my wife, when we went to Edmonton, she she just made a Twitter just because I, I'd been on it and kind of t- 
you know, she like during Oilers games, I'm always on there and kind of tweeting right. back and forth with people. But she made it just, you know, when we were going and she, she looked at my handle and she's like, oh, what what does that say? I'm like, it's our last name. Just backwards. yeah. So but yeah, just S-U-A-R-K-88. That's me. All right. So everyone, please go give Brandon a follow. Man, uh, just like I said, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I hope you'll be back sometime. And just it was great getting to even just meet you in Edmonton a couple weeks ago, too. So, yeah, we'll definitely do this again sometime. Yeah, it was great to be on. I, you know, I don't often get a chance to talk Oilers hockey with another person for <laughs> for any amount of time. You know, my wife indulges me, but it's it's been it's been a great talking to you. Yeah, man. Well, you got an open invitation to come back anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate you. All right. Have a good night, Brandon. You too. Thank you. So for Brandon Krause, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out.